Well, first of all, thank you, um, Jerome, for the introduction. And I want to thank the IPAM to make this happen. Um, it's a good experience. So I changed my title a little bit. I'll focus on the algorithm side. I was, I was going to talk both about theory and algorithms, but it seems like there wouldn't be enough time for one thing. And the other thing is that uh, theory is not as complete as I would uh, I had hoped. So this is a joint work with um, uh, Jishun Han Princeton and Anup Jensen, who used to be a postdoc at Princeton, but now a professor at University of Munster. The, these are the examples of um, PDs, which could very easily be high dimensional. They have the jacobi bellman equation from control theory. Here, the dimension is, dimension is the dimension of the state space. For example, if you're controlling a PDE, then the dimension will be infinite. Uh, the next example will be um, Black Schultz equation. Here, the dimension is a number of underlying um, assets, for example, uh, the, the uh, number of stocks you want to price over some sort of option over these stocks. Um, and then, the, um, perhaps the best known equation for high dimension is the Schrodinger equation. Here, the dimensionality is three times the number of electrons. So, if your system has a thousand electrons, which is a very small system, that dimension is 3,000. But we're not going to talk about this, this particular PDE because there's a lot of things that's, a, that's very special to this PDE. We'll be talking about the first two class of examples. Okay, um, curse of dimension is the problem, as uh, Professor Chikong just talked about. As a matter of fact, curse of dimensionality was a term coined by uh, Richard Bellman in the context of control problems. Um, so here is a summary of the current status of the algorithms in high dimensional PDs. Um, okay, this is a very rough summary. Uh, there are many things that's missing, but I'm sort of trying to highlight the most important things. The first is there are special class of PDs, for example, near, linear parabolic PDs, which, which you can write on the Feynman Katz formula using, and then you value the Feynman Katz formula using Monte Carlo. So these one can handle high dimensions. There are special PDs like how many job, Jacobi PD for which you can write down a solution in terms of Hopf formula. And then, can, then the problem becomes optimization problem. And then um, uh, our chairman and Stan Osher has developed algorithms for in that context. Schrodinger equation, uh, one of the most um, influential papers on using um, machine learning for um, high dimensional PDs is this paper by Calio and Troyer in which they looked at Schrodinger equations for spins and they used uh, various special kinds of um, neural network, which is a restricted Boltzmann machine, hard -like neural network model, actually. Um, then they used variation of Monte Carlo and least squares as uh, to formulate the problem in terms of a learning problem. And then for electrons, the first paper was written by Han, uh, Zhang, and myself. And, and then DeepMind continued uh, to look at electrons uh, many electron problems showing equation. And in the variational setting, I wrote a paper with a student, Yu. We just uh, proposed something called a uh, deep rich method. As a matter of fact, we didn't really want to, the, the motivation was not to uh, propose a deep rich method. Deep rich method was more, more or less a, a triviality. We wanted to do something called deep galaxy, which would be a weak formulation, but that still, still uh, hasn't been done. Um, well, there, there's some work on this, but it's still not like solving 100 dimensions uh, yet. There is a class of param uh, parametric PDEs that, um, these are low dimensional PDEs, but work with random coefficients. So uh, there's an early paper by uh, Ku and Lu and Ying looked at this uh, using uh, neural network techniques. Reinforcement learning is related to solving Bellman equations, so that's always uh, related. Now, my talk will be focused on this page. So control problems, especially stochastic control problems. That's um, the paper wrote, uh, uh, and, uh, written by Han and myself, which I think is the very first paper that applied deep neural networks to solve high dimensional scientific computing problems. In the deterministic context, you've just seen the talk which discussed this problem using neural networks to solve high dimensional deterministic control problems. And in semi-linear parabolic PDs, this is a, there's currently a lot of work. There's special classes of uh, semi-linear parabolic PDs for which you can 
form it as a branch and diffusion problem. So there are algorithms associated with that. But it's sort of rather limited, not just in terms of application, but in terms of the uh, performance, uh, limited to small time, small data problems. Multi-level Picard method, which I'm going to mention a little bit, that's currently perhaps sort of the most studied in terms of theoretical analysis. And, um, and then deep DSD, which I'll also talk about. And then related, uh, uh, and, and then the, uh, deep, uh, the work of, uh, uh, actually I can't pronounce these names. Um, uh, you can see at the end of the page. Um, so they proposed something called the um, deep Galaki method. But what they really did was D squared. So as I just said, deep Galaki is still a bit of an open problem. The problem with deep Galaki is that you want to, to do weak formulation. I think weak formulation in, to, in the context of deep learning is still in general an issue. So these are the summary of the algorithms. Let me just say a little bit about theory. So theory here, here means two things, but actually there's one thing. Theory, on one hand, we talk about convergence theory. On the other hand, we talk about PDE theory, so high dimensional PDE theory. So uh, let, let me first say some, uh, something about convergence theory. So there are two results uh, about uh, um, convergence theory. One is for multi-level Picard, which I'm going to mention a little bit. Here, we have proved um, that if you want to get an error of order epsilon, then the number of samples, namely the complexity required, is bounded by a constant, 100, times d, which is the dimensionality, times epsilon to the minus 4, plus any you know, little delta. The same result can be proved for neural networks. So you can prove that for the class of PDEs that we're going to talk about, you can cook up, you can cook up a construct in your network with whose number of parameters is bounded by the same kind of quantity and whose, the error of the approximation will be less than epsilon. Okay, so these are the, right now, the convergence theories, uh, convergence, uh, the complexity estimates. Now, we're also interested in study the PD itself, the solutions of PDs. For example, you know, in classical analysis of PDs, we would try to prove that solution would have some regularity, some sublevel, best of space regularity. I want to emphasize that in high dimensions, the questions are different. I would say it's not about regularity. You know, if, you have, if the solution have, has five derivatives or 100 derivatives, it doesn't really matter too much, but rather about the complexity. If we say the solution is in Donska space, so that's a kind of a space which has low complexity. That means a lot. So these convergence theorems that I stated above, in some sense, is the, is an, uh, are estimates about the complexity of the solutions. Okay, here are the three papers I'll talk about. The paper, um, 19, uh, 2016 paper on control, and the two papers about BSD, uh, deep BSD methods. So let me, before I start about neural networks, let me say something about multi-level Picard. So you consider this nonlinear uh, hyperbolic equation, terminal condition. So this is the wrong sign because this is in the context of finance problems. So we talk about terminal problems, you know, initial problems. So multi-level Picard proceeds in the following way. First, you write down the nonlinear PDE as a integral equation using the guide iteration. Now, when you write the guide iteration, there is an integral operator associated with the heat, heat kernel, and you can express that heat kernel in terms of Wiener process. So that's step one. Step two, you set up an iteration scheme, the guide iteration, but you write that in the incremental form. So un is equal to something like un minus one, uh, un minus one minus un minus two, so incremental form. And then in each one term of this incremental form, you do Monte Carlo, but you don't compute Monte Carlo with the same kind of accuracy. So this is multi-level Monte Carlo. The details, I'm not gonna go through the details, but what I wanna say is that for this scheme, one can show, prove rigorously, that for the kind of equation uh, that, that's listed here, the computational cost scales like you know, linear in terms of dimension and epsilon to the minus four. And that's, um, uh, at the present time, this is the, uh, up to my knowledge, this is the only algorithm, algorithm that's 
show globally to converge with this kind of a, a, a complexity estimates. So let me talk about BSD. So start with linear equation. So linear parabolic equation, uh, you can write down. So here again is a terminal con conditions given. We want to compute say u solution at t equal to zero. So this is not the usual formulation, but for finance people it should be familiar. So the solution can be expressed in terms of the stochastic process dxt, or the diffusion process. And then we have this little formula express solution in terms of expectation. Then we can always compute that expectation using Monte Carlo. That's classical. So this kind of algorithms clearly overcomes the curse of dimensionality. So we want to do the same thing for nonlinear PDEs. So first we have to have some sort of analog of, Monte, uh, of Feynman Katz formula. So nonlinear version of Feynman Katz, uh, well, okay, this is not exactly Feynman Katz, this is actually simpler than Feynman Katz because there is no potential form. Uh, Okay, shouldn't go up. Anyway, so we won't have similar form, uh, formula like that. So let's start with this nonlinear parabolic PDE. Okay, so we define same kind of diffusion process XT, and Ito's lemma tells you that the solution to that PDE can be formulated as an integral equation, very much like the Picard iteration I was talking about. So the right hand side involves the solution also at this point. Okay, now here is an important uh, slide because it's the nonlinear Feynman Katz representation of the nonlinear a solution of the nonlinear PDE. So the idea is that you consider this backwards stochastic PDE. The first equation is the same as the previous. So this is the previous XT, the division process. The second equation, the Y there is really like if you, you want to if you want to think about the PD, Y is very much like our um, U, and the Z here is very much like the sigma times the grad U. Anyway, so but BSD is backwards stochastic differential equations has its own life, has its own meaning. So if you just think about this coupled BSD where the unknowns are X, Y, and Z, then it can be proved that there is a unique adaptive process for this system of BSD. So this is, a, to me, this is amazing because we have two equations, three unknowns, but yet the solution is still unique. So you can think of, for me, as an amateur, I think of ZT as being <clears throat> a Lagrange multiplier for the constraint that the solution is supposed to be adapted process. Okay, so now, <clears throat> and this is also related to the Pondragon maximum principle for the parabolic, uh, for the stochastic control problem. Remember, Gongqi mentioned Pondragon maximum principle. This is the uh, sort of analog in the stochastic control case. Anyway, so using this BSD, the BSD that we know we have, there's a unique solution. We can now formulate the PDE problem. We can now write down this. Uh, 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 okay, maybe I should. Okay, maybe I should say the connection between. I already said this. The connection between. The BSD and the PD is that the Y stands for U. The Z is a bit like the sigma times grand U. Okay, anyway, now we can formulate the P as this variation of problem. Namely, we're minimizing with respect to U0, which is the solution we want to compute, and ZT, that's sort of the Lagrange multiplier. We, minim we, we, we minimize over that set of choice the expected difference between G, the terminal condition at Y, at big time T, subject to that X and Y satisfy the BSD. One can show there's a unique minimizer, and that unique minimizer is a solution to the PD. Now, I want to sort of emphasize this because this reformulation of the original BSD, uh, original nonlinear PD, because there's sort of a tendency now that Deep learning is such a powerful tool. So we just apply deep learning blindly to whatever problem we have at, time, at, 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 at our hand. I personally feel that's probably not the right approach for any problem we have in hand. We really have to formulate the problem in such a way that's really adapted to deep learning. And I'll see what I mean by that. So here's the first step, namely reformulating the nonlinear PDE problem as a variational problem. And this variational problem is going to be our loss function. For the uh, for the learning problem, okay. So here are the algorithm. 
Step one is to discretize in time. So remember, so let me say, remember, we want to compute this guy. We want to compute this map from initial from some point X to the value of the solution at that point. Okay, so these guys, but we can represent them as neural networks. So step one is to discretize in time. So then the, the, the continuous problem, the variational problems we're talking about becomes this discrete variational problem. The BSD is discretized in the, same, in the same way. So now the observation, the key observation is that we're gonna have a sub-network for each discrete time TN to represent these guys, these, these, these Zs. And the whole thing together, all these sub stacked together would be a global composite neural network. So the neural architecture is a little bit like this. Remember, we're gonna parameterize, we're gonna use neural networks to parameterize two things. One is this guy, the solution function, and the other is the Z, the Lagrange multiplier. So each one of them will be represented by a neural network. So in total, its architectures look like this. So here we have the neural network for, uh, what is it? So here we have the neural network for the Z at this time. T1, neural network for the, uh, T2, and et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then the, the, these, each one of these neural networks takes sample of the noise because these are, remember these are the, these solutions of the BSD is encoded here. And for each BSD, for the BSD, we have the sample of the rent of the winner process, the noise. And then, so this is a composite neural network so if each subnetwork has H sort of uh, layers, then the whole thing will be roughly like H plus one, you know, number of layers here, right here. Okay, so now, as I said, that the, um, the um, uh, loss function is this guy, the loss function is this guy, we're just, we're just, just gonna mat, minimize this loss function using stochastic gradient descent. And we call this the BSD method because clearly we use BSD formulation. Okay, why does this work? So there are three important ingredients for deep neural networks. The first one is data. You have to have data. Remember in Qigong's talk, he started out by saying we have to compute some solution to get the data to train. So here we didn't have any training data. Our, in our training, our data comes from the noise, the sampling of the winner process. So this is an example of machine learning without data, with no need for data. And we coined, my student and I, we coined a little term terminology for this kind of learning, which is concurrent learning. So, okay, anyway, that's not important for this talk, but namely, but it's important to realize that we are doing machine learning without pre-computing or getting you know, some data beforehand. The second is that I told you that this is a really deep neural network usually. You know, several hundred layers is easily several hundred layers. How can we treat a train such a deep neural network? In the context of supervised learning, we learned that if you really want to train very, very deep neural network, the network better be a ResNet, better be in a residual form. And here you can notice that naturally, your network is in a residual form because the U is in a residual form. So it very naturally, this is a ResNet, resembles a nested, nested, uh, 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 ResNet. And then because the noise comes from the winner process, so naturally this is a fitted with, very much fit with stochastic gradient descent. So this is the work we, you know, that went into the development of BSD. We try to formulate the method in such a way that it very naturally fits, uh, uses the um, deep, net, uh, deep neural networks all the advantages of deep neural networks. Okay, let me show you some examples. Okay, so uh, here are some information details. Um, actually, that's not so important, um, but it, you know, it's important to know that it runs on a simple machine, MacBook, MacBook actually, and there is a code um, um, that everybody can download. As a matter of fact, many people download the code and they're trying themselves. And here is the access to the code and it's maintained by Jishin. <clears throat> so let's 
So this is an example of stochastic control, very simple example, simplest example of stochastic control. In the hamilton jacobi equation, this guy looks like a viscous um, hamilton jacobi equation. So this looks like if you, and then the solution can be expressed in this, in this form. So we take this example because the solution can be expressed as an expectation. If you recognize that this is actually the hopf cole formula. No, yeah, this is actually the hopf cole formula for the uh, viscous case. So since we have this expectation form, we can evaluate the exact solution using some Monte Carlo and compare it to the, algorithm, uh, to the solution we get from uh, DPSD. So that comparison is here. You know, this is a, the horizontal is a, is a, is a value of lambda. A uh, vertical line is are the solutions at a particular time. We're doing this in 100 dimension, as you notice. <clears throat> no, it's not set here. But anyway, we're doing this in 100 dimension. And here are the details, and it takes like 300 seconds on the laptop. And this is the sort of the training, um, the, 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 the training, uh, how the training process goes. The shaded area is the shows the standard deviation when you do different samples of the noise and the mean is the mean. Um, okay, so this is one example. The second example, a more realistic example is Black-Scholz equation with default risk. So Black-Scholz equation is for pricing options. And here we take into account, um, so if you uh, if your option, you know, basket option, for example, you have a basket of these underlines, underlines, and then it's a high, real, then you would have a high dimensional problem. And we are also taking into account some nonlinear effects, for example, default uh, risk. And we're taking a model from uh, a paper by a classical paper by Duffy, where they treated cheap, um, the five dimensional case, and so this is the kind of nonlinearity that goes, goes into the equation, where Q is some nonlinear function, has a very com rather complicated expression that I'm not gonna write down. And these are the uh, sort of assumptions that goes into the model. Anyway, you can solve this again in 100 dimensions. So in this case, we don't have exact solution, but we have the multi-level Picard method. So we can use the multi-level Picard method to compute another solution which we regard as an exact solution. And then <clears throat> you can see as the, you know, the convergence as you train the neural network, the convergence to the, the solution over the multi-level guide range. Again, this is in 100 dimension. So this is a sort of a little, uh, really little game we're playing. We're solving Allen Kahn equation in 100 dimension. It really has no physical meaning as far as I can tell, but Allen Kahn equation is an important equation for two and three dimensions in statistical physics, pattern formation, stuff like that. And then you can see that you can, you know, the algorithm BSD method solves, you know, reasonable performance if you look at the training uh, history. And on the left is just the solution as a function of time at x equal to zero. So this is the issue with study 100 dimensional PDEs. You don't know how, what to plot. So we are plotting a time history at a particular point. So let me mention uh, the work we did in stochastic control. Basically, because for two reasons. One is that this is the very first paper, as well as I can tell, that uses deep learning for um, high dimensional uh, uh, scientific computing problem. That's number one. Uh, number two is that there is a direct method that one can use to solve the control problem. Um, also, closed loop control, not open loop, but still closed loop control. Um, you don't have to go to the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman. So, for simplicity, we're looking at control problems in discrete time. So, S represents the state. So, here this is the dynamical system, and then you have this, you're minimizing this objective. Okay, we're looking at, you know, looking for feedback control. So, again, we're going to, we're going to parameterize the feedback control at each time slide by a new network. So if we start at theta t, that means approximate by a new network where the theta t is the parameter for that new network at time t. So then this is naturally our loss function because we had a control problem to begin with. This is gonna be our loss function. We're gonna just train the neural networks to satisfy, to minimize this loss function. 
as you can see, the architecture is very much the same because at each time slider, we have a network to parameterize the feedback control. So that together is the compositing network, and then we minimize the uh, um, uh, the objective function for you know for the whole structure. So here are the, some examples. Um, so I'm just I'm just going to go over very quickly. So this is an example of um, optimal execution of some portfolios. Some um, um, you want to sell a lot of stocks, which you might want to do now, and you want to have the optimal strategy. And this these are sort of different curves means different terminal time. So time 20, time 25, time 30. So this is, is a case where you have 23 on the lines and uh, three-dimensional controls, or uh, 10 dimensional, sorry, 10 dimensional controls. Again, so the, the curves are the mean of you know from different runs and then the shaded areas the standard deviation from different runs. This is an energy storage problem, very similar. Um, in four dimension, not very high, and the control is the five dimension. And this is if you have put in many devices like 20, 30, 40, 50, and you can still, the algorithm still works pretty well. Okay, so now I want to talk about some theory, some theoretical results. I'm not going to talk about proofs, but I'll mention what the results are, what, what, what are the results we know. Okay, so this is a um, theorem that's proved by um, Anof Jensen and his collaborators. Anof is probably, you know, pushing this as far as um, hard as anybody uh, right now. So here we are not proving convergence of the DPSD method. Here we're just asking whether the solution can be approximated by some neural networks. So in this setting, you have a sequence of P solutions of so a sequence of PDs here, indexed by D, the dimensionality. So this is the way that Onof likes to have it, namely it has explicit in the, uh, uh, in, um, in, uh, D is uh, used in a subscript to um, explicitly indicate the dimensionality dependence. And the initial condition satisfies some sort of a growth condition. So this is the problem. So then you can prove that for any epsilon, there is a neural network, there are two neural networks, one for the initial condition, one for the solution. Okay, and they, their error, the, the error to the solution is bounded by epsilon, and the number of parameters, this is the important part, the number of parameters is bounded by dimension D times epsilon to the minus four. So delta is some arbitrarily small, uh, small number that I, maybe, maybe uh, we can get rid of. <clears throat> so I want to emphasize, this is just saying that there exists a neural network that approximates a solution to certain accuracy. And so this is the statement about the complexity of the solution. So this is not about the DPSD method. So regarding the uh, DPSD method, the only results we have now is about um, time discretization. So for example, you can show in the context of BSD that the solutions compare, if you discretize the BSD, then, this, then, then, then the error you make is bounded by the, you know, the step size to plus that the error you're making at the terminal time, you know, terminal condition. So the interesting part is, to, you know, we need to control this part. And for that, there's the next, um, um, the theorem, which again is proved by Han, uh, Jeju Han, and uh, Long. Um, so that error in the terminal condition is bounded by the error you're making in the, in, the, in the parameterization of Z. Z is, remember if Z are these, uh, uh, is the third variable in the BSD, so, something like the Lagrange multiplier. And phi is the parameterization, say, using your network. So now, if we know, if, so this turns the theorem, this two theorem turns the problem into a sort of supervised learning problem. So in the beginning, we had 
BSD method for solving PDEs or BSDs. So by using this theorem, we do reduce the problem to bounding these guys, which are sort of um, error estimates for standard supervised learning problems, which can, which is another topic, which is another topic, uh, well, independent topic. Okay, so this kind of ideas have been applied to pricing fast options. So Anov and his uh, collaborators and also people on the Wall Street, some people on the Wall Street are using these kind of uh, BSD methods to pricing options, at least that's what they say. Um, interest rate dependent options. So these are path dependent options. So path dependent essentially is sort of like infinite dimensional problem if we think of it continuous way, but in practice, of course, it's discrete, but still high dimensional. And it has been applied to solving BSDs. As a matter of fact, one of the classical difficulty for BSDs is that it's difficult to solve them in high dimensions. And this class of algorithms um, have successfully addressed that problem. And there's and control problems, as we saw in the last talk. And there are many extensions of, of these kind of ideas, be it in backward stochastic differential equation, forwards, backward, and uh, stuff. Uh, um, lots of work. This is a quite active field right now. <clears throat> it's also been extended by Jie Cheng and his collaborator, uh, Raymond Hu. Um, to game theory, they developed something called deep fictitious play, uh, handle problems, uh, game theory in high dimensions, <clears throat> very much relevant to problems in e economics and finance. Okay, so uh, let me summarize. Uh, I'm going fast. <clears throat> so first of all, I want to say that deep learning based algorithms are very powerful tools for dealing with very high dimensional PDEs not just PDs and control problems. As a matter of fact, deep learning, it seemed to be a very high, uh, very powerful tool for dealing with many high dimensional problems. And this opens up lots of possibilities in um, economics, finance, original research. By physics, I really have in mind the Schrodinger equation, but I didn't talk about the Schrodinger equation. That's that, that development solving Schrodinger equations has uh, developed along rather different line, uh, quite different from the kind of ideas I discussed here. So that's why I'm not talking about it. And it's all, all still, um, I would say, I would say in a much less mature shape. So that's another reason I, I, I didn't want to talk about it. Second remark is that I already said this, but I want to repeat it here. Even though deep learning is a very pow powerful tool, one still needs to formulate the problem in the right way in order to best make best use of deep learning, um, uh, the deep learning te techniques or the powers of deep learning. And I want to say that the study of high dimensional control problems and the Hamilton and Jacobi Bellman equations is going to be a very exciting field in the near future. For one thing, we can now realistically address these problems. We can compute their solutions and do serious applications. For another thing is that these class of problems are new, exciting mathematical problems. We can ask about, you know, solving Hamilton Jacobi equation in 10,000 dimensions. What does that mean? The solution have to be rather simple in a way in order for us to be able to solve such high dimensional uh, PDE problems. And same, same thing can be said about control problems. So I would say this is going to be a very exciting field in the near future. So you can all, uh, my papers, you can find the details of my papers, you can find my webpage. And um, as a matter of fact, we're, uh, Jitrin and uh, Arnold, we're writing a, a, a sort of a review for this, um, for this topic, and we hope it'll be very uh, available quite soon. So this is what I, want, uh, what I want to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wei Nan. So are there any questions? You can raise your hand or text me in the chat room. Okay, Wei Kang has a question. You can go, Wei. Okay, uh, hey Wei Nan, nice talk. Hi, Hi thank uh, you. Enjoy it. Um, one question is that, you know, when you, uh, 
do this uh, training, before you do the training, I notice that you discretize uh, this uh, mm -hmm. stochastic equation. Uh, how do you determine the step size when you, uh, the time step size when you do the discretization? Okay, right now it's kind of arbitrary. We call it, I, I don't know, when you call it maybe 30 or 100 or something like that. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, um, it's just a number we pick. Is that what you're asking? Step size? Oh, okay, we're not doing that. We're not okay. We're not doing adaptive time stepping. Uh, no, that's not so. Right now, it's just equal time step, equal time step size. You know, pick a, some small number. So then, you know. once you choose a certain number, hundred or or fifty yeah. or whatever, then how you know you, you can tell something about the, it's uh, adequate or not through the loss function or through the convergence rate or how, how you know is there any criteria yeah certainly you can talk tell, because your loss function is how much your solution matches how, how much the uh, terminal condition is matched so mm -hmm. if the terminal condition is not matched is far and then you, you certainly you're not doing something not adequate right so maybe your step size is too big Maybe your neural sample is too mm -hmm. small, or maybe your neural neural is not uh, expressive enough. I should mention that we can always sort of the, the this problem, this atom is essentially an infinite data problem because we can always increase the samples yeah. by you know continuously sampling the winner process. So um, so mainly the error comes from the time discretization and the new network parameterization. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. There is another question from Adam Oberman. Okay. Hi, and nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to understand better the method. The uh, it's based on Picard estimation and the representation formula by BSDs. Oh no no no! There are two Picard and BSDs are two different ideas. Picard okay. is Picard. So Picard there we write you know the solution in terms of Picard iteration, and then um, write that as a as an incre incremental multi level form, and then apply some sort of multi level Monte Carlo. So there. There's no BSD, no um, neural networks, no machine learning. That's it. So big guy iterated iteration with Monte Carlo, but we formulated it as a multi, multi scale, multi level way. And then the, for the neural network, we first formulated the PDE in terms of uh, BSD. So BSD is like the method of characteristics for this for the nonlinear PDE. So then we minimize, uh, we, we, we um, parameterize the uh, variables in the BSD, particularly the Z variables in the BSD and using neural networks. And then it's quadrature. Quadrature, uh, it's quadrature. So the loss function is the terminal conditions. Right. And the neural network is kind of a discretization of the, the Z equation and the X equation. So, no, you discretize the z x. You know the x y z equation is the BSD. Yeah. So you discretize that in time. Yeah. Okay. Then for each z, z at each time, you parameterize by a neural network. So suppose yeah. you discretize in hundred time steps, then you would have hundred z's, and you parameterize yeah. each one of these by a neural network. Okay. And so the dimension only comes up in the size of the z vector. Yeah, exactly. So as a matter of fact, this is one thing we should think about improving because this is, you know, you have, you, it's, it's clear there's a lot of redundancy, right? Because yeah. we're parameterizing each Z at each time step by a, another neural network. So there's a lot of improvement one can do. And do you use concentration of measure? Like that would be one place maybe where you could. Do you use it anywhere? Not at this stage, no. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Yes, Aaron, give me one second. So there was a question from Aaron Palmer. Okay, you can go ahead. 
Hi, I was uh, wondering about what sort of considerations go into choosing the parameters for the neural network. And also if you could elaborate more on the residual structure where that fits in. Okay, so parameters go to your network. Actually, that's not much. You can see these are the parameters. Where are they? Here. So it's almost arbitrary. So four layers, one input layer, two hidden layers, and one output layer. It's almost like it's fairly robust. So th there's not very much of a uh, thing one can. So Relu as the activation function, optimize with ADAM, these are pretty standard. Mm -hmm. um, what was the second question? I'm sorry. And you, you mentioned that it's important to have a residual structure. Oh, yeah, residual structure. You look yeah. at this. So you see, if you look at it, so here, here is u, right? U is, no, this is this u equation is clearly an incremental form. U t n plus one minus u t n, it's something times delta t. And that's, it's, this is very much similar to uh, ResNets. And if you look at a new network, so you are, so this new network here, each one of these, so the, you, you are, you're accumulating u here. And then the contribution goes into the increment in the U. So that's the very natural residual structure. Oh, so it's already fit into this architecture automatically. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If, if you don't have this, then you wouldn't be able to train this. Mm -hmm. It would be unstable. Thank you. Mm, you're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Carl, you can go. Okay. I, you, it's not a major thing. You mentioned that you are solving by stochastic gradient, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not, it wasn't your focus, I understand. Nonetheless, I'm interested, uh, number one, why you chose stochastic gradient, and number two, any kind of comments on its performance? Well, stochastic gradient is very, so first of all, it's very naturally fit, uh, naturally fits the current setting because okay. it's time to the noises, right? So, um, and certainly, if you don't do stochastic gradient, what does that mean? That means you have to sample enough noise beforehand, and then you sum them together, and then minimize the whole thing with you know, average over the noise. That would be very expensive. So very natural okay. here, you, you do stochastic gradient descent. No, I'm not questioning that. I'm just curious whether this is the only reasonable, conceivable choice. Yes, that's what I'm saying. This is the yes, only- Yes, thank you, reasonable. thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you, that's all. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? If not, then let's go to the breakout uh, session. Thank you very much, uh, Wynan. Thank you. Thank you.